Yeah, so um, let me uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, lunchtime uh, lecture. And this is in our continuing series about uh, Asia in uh, Marxism and Marxism in Asia. Uh, I'm Nathan Hill, uh, director of the Center for Asian Studies. And today's speaker is Edwin Mickelson, who, who studied uh, Japanese studies at Leiden for his BA and MA and did his PhD at the University of Toronto, uh, finishing in 2021. Uh, his dissertation was called uh, Assembling Solidarity, Proletarian Arts and Internationalism in East Asia. Uh, and I think that uh, today's talk is uh, linked to this uh, topic. And uh, the talk is called Celebrating the Proletariat, May Day Strikes and Syntheses of Solidarity. I would like to thank, of course, Professor Nathan Hill for inviting me. I'm really honored to receive his invitation last year to be part of this uh, speaker series and to present my research. Um, I would also, of course, like to thank uh, the Trinity Asian Studies Center at the University of Dublin for hosting me. Okay, great. So uh, this is my uh, research that is now part of my current manuscript, and I will try to show you how I examine proletarian literature and arts in East Asia through the notion of international solidarity. I argue that solidarity in proletarian literature and culture is not merely an allegiance to organizational structures such as political parties, labor unions, and hierarchical groups, as is conventionally understood, but a process of assembling the myriad of differences and often oppositional interests into semi-stable and temporary formations of unity. Then I will examine practices of assembling solidarity found in the intermediate culture and a cultural and literary production surrounding May Day, the International Workers' Day, celebrating the intimate relationships between political struggles through mass strikes and demonstrations against imperial capitalist oppression worldwide, proletarian writers and artists aimed to weave together innumerable spatial experiences into cohesive proletarian space-time. Proletarian literature focusing on international encounters and interaction between proletarians in East Asia, different from hierarchical organizational structures, which many proletarian intellectuals consider necessary to foster class consciousness and prepare revolution, the contingent encounter between so-called unorganized proletarians from various backgrounds depicted in proletarian literature and arts reveals that solidarity was not a presupposed relation, but rather a process that needed to be assembled in the event itself. The stories show readers that attempts at defining solidarity were coeval with the probability of encounters from which these very relations of solidarity could emerge. Yet it was difficult for these encounters to occur because the Japanese imperial and Guomindang governments, together with local rulers, colonial rulers, and warlords, constructed various systems to limit and control exchange among proletarians in East Asia. Moreover, a mutually intelligible language was required to make exchange possible among the international proletariat. Writers presented encounters with coolies, factory workers, and prostitutes, or turned their attention to the exploitation of col uh, colonized proletarian figures in their stories to agitate a readership to show solidarity with colonial struggles. Many of these stories were set in Manchuria, further explored in works by writers who grappled with ethnic tensions created by imperialists, while also searching for possible political alliances of resistance among proletarians, and others invested in describing the revolutionary potential in mainland China following the split between the Kuomintang and the Chinese Communist Party in 1927, inspired to imagine a similar potential to unfold in the Japanese empire. Taken together, then thousands of proletarian literary works were written within a decade in East Asia to render visible the growing social enemy and call for solidarity with millions of disenfranchised. Proletarian writers were neither merely preoccupied with creating alternative uh, worlds in their literary narratives, nor celebrated a naive proletarian harmony, but also concerned themselves with the daily mechanisms of racial and gender divisions installed by ruling classes that resulted in discrimination and serious hostility among proletarians. Proletarian writers strive to expose the divisive ramifications of the multi-layered unevenness among proletarians in East Asia and with help of cultural movements, explored options to facilitate exchange among proletarians, both in their storylines and through social activities. Proletarian literature focusing on international encounters and interaction between proletarians in East Asia to unfold along the lines of ethnic differences, such as Korean, Japanese, Taiwanese, and Chinese, 
Understanding solidarity with others as such would not merely assume and reproduce a certain logic uh, of identity produced in capitalist states and nation states, but also significantly limit our understanding of what proletarian solidarity was and could have been. Solidarity in proletarian literature is not so much writing about others stemming from ethno-national differences, but rather about a shared yet uneven relationship of capitalist alienation, eclipsing and obfuscating self and other in a proletarian alterity. Put differently, proletarian writers responded to an increasing in inequality worldwide by writing about concerns of proletarian struggles, even through the nature of these struggles is often irreducibly different and incommensurable, while trying to find ways how to interconnect and defragment innumerable narratives of suffering and exploitation. Enhancing and reconfiguring notions of proletarian class solidarity, proletarian writers and arts joined these debates by questioning how ideas of solidarity uh, could be weaved into literary and artistic narratives on, to unfold a proletarian praxis of international solidarity. For example, Miyamoto Yuriko addressed this question directly, highlighting ways to write about solidarity. For Miyamoto, pro pro uh, political struggles are not divided by identities such as race, as there are, quote, no blacks and whites uh, among proletarian classes, but only delineated by, quote, one land border between the world proletariat and the world bourgeoisie. Literature, then, must account for such borders and how they affect various proletarian communities. Miyamoto expressed her worry that if proletarian writers fail to do so, popular narratives of bourgeois exotic taste celebrating ethno-nationalism will gain the upper hand, dividing peoples in national camps. She warned proletarian writers not to reproduce the imperial nation-state logic of categorizing peoples that could be detrimental to the assembling of solidarity among proletarians. Instead, to account for, quote, colonial exploitation as a necessity of the capitalist uh, ideology, she proposes a proletarian literature that describes the mutual possibilities, contradictions, difficulties, and advances of various proletarian collectives, while also accounting its relation to domestic and international events. Although Miyamoto's requirements might seem ambitious uh, and perhaps difficult to realize in a single work, she hoped that such a writing style would diversify proletarian literature. Nonetheless, the problem that lingered in Miyamoto's theorization is how to reconfigure the, these very ethno-national modifiers essentialized in bourgeois literature. Reading through proletarian theoretical texts, we learn that to understand uh, solidarity, which then often uh, in general is translated as uh, rentai, lendai, or yonde in the East Asian languages, as merely an equivalent of solidarity would limit our analysis and filter grasp ideas and practices of solidarity in proletarian cultural movements. In order to grasp the praxis of proletarian solidarity, I'm informed by a range of related terms taken from East Asian languages surrounding solidarity and human association, which are frequently used in proletarian theory, criticism, media, and literature. Used to various degrees in East Asian languages, some of these terms are redefinitions of existing words, while others are neologisms through translingual practices. Taken together, these terms reveal that proletarian solidarity was never a presupposed given based on some natural order, but rather a continuous process of assembling of proletarian so struggles into synthesized uh, configurations of solidarity through practice in an experience of contingent events. Theoretical practical manifestations of proletarian solidarity occur then through linking, joining, and combining what I call assembling solidarity. But to show you uh, how such assembling of solidarity took place, I'll now turn to Mayday uh, and discuss some of the cultural production where I locate uh, such assembling of, of, uh, of solidarity through the idea of a synthesis, making synthesis between the various proletarian space times. So among the first texts that introduced Mayday to a Chinese language audience are those by Li Dajiao, the co-founder of the communist, uh, Chinese Communist Party. They dealt with Mayday, labor issues and imperial oppression in 1920, the day before the first official Mayday in East Asia, which was celebrated in the urban areas of Japan and coastal China, the industrial heartland. Li wrote a piece titled, The Light Movement of Asian Youth. In it, he notes that Asian youth should not be misled by imposed and fabricated differences which nurture antagonistic feelings against one another, but should instead focus on what interests could, be bring, could bring them together. Lee urged the youth in East Asia to cooperate and form a resistance against privileged classes 
referring to Japanese militarism and capitalist encroachment. He warns against the racial and ethnic division produced by uh, capitalist nation states. If intellectuals and proletarians fail to nurture an awareness of these divisions, they will end up believing the propaganda of nation states and nationalists, thus producing a strong jingoism, which can only lead to hatred among peoples in East Asia or Asia in general. Rather, according to Lee, the youth in Asia must understand that the only observable real division for him was then produced by capitalism, which is class division. Against uh, the class division, Lee proclaims that youth movements in Asia should be capable of finding common ground and establishing a world mentality, as he called it, and initiating resistance against capitalism and imperialism, as well as improving labor and human rights. Lee's notably international view was imperative for proletarian movements emerging throughout the 1920s in general and for May Day celebrations in particular. He had already articulated a crucial challenge for proletarian solidarity, namely the fascistic manifestations of Japanese imperialism through the dispersal of national and racial identities, which could drive wedges among the proletarians. May Day celebrations in coastal China and urban Japan immediately resonated uh, throughout the Japanese empire. Colonial proletarians joined May Day processions and strikes in industrial centers in Japan proper and tried to celebrate May Day in col the colonies Korea and Taiwan. Proletarian art artists from Korea residing in Japan, such as Red Fist, um, actively produced Korean language materials as shown here, which introduced May Day uh, to proletarians who had migrated from the Korean peninsula. While proletarians were able to celebrate May Day in Japan and China, proper to some extent, those living in Japanese colonies faced fierce restrictions and oppression by authorities. This did not mean, however, that colonial proletarians could not engage in May Day. For example, in colonial Taiwan, proletarians also attempted to celebrate May Day. In one of the few remaining sources on May Day, the 1931 June issue of New Taiwan uh, Mass Newspaper, half of the uh, pages were dedicated to May Day. Contributor contributors argued that striking was one of the few weapons the proletarians had in Taiwan. This issue gives a unique insight into the workers' organizations and their activities across the island, as well as a brief history of May Day in Taiwan. In an article called The Situation of Labor in Taiwan, Labor Day in Taiwan, um, the author, who's not mentioned by name, gives an overview of May Day in the various regions of Taiwan. Among the slogans of May Day in each region, there are those speaking out for support of China, calling for a retreat of foreign soldiers from China, support for the Soviet Union and the inter international proletariat, and gender labor equality among proletarians. Together, these slogans show that proletarian groups in Taiwan envisioned a multi-layered organization from the grassroots level to the regional and worldwide levels, debunking the idea that these groups were minor players in a larger national, in this case, Japanese proletarian movement. A clear and well-articulated program of slogans and strikes by workers, peasants, and sympathizers assembled Taiwanese proletarians with overseas Chinese and Japanese workers in Taiwan stressing regional alliances among workers and reconfiguring imperial borders. Taken together, these texts reveal that Made in East Asia was not merely about reforming the capitalist working day, the initial May Day demand was the eight hour working day, but from its inception, proletarian intellectuals in East Asia rebaptized the festival into an annual commemoration against Japanese imperialism. Proletarian cultural movements in East Asia were divided in organizations along genres, such as film, photography, literature, music, and theater. Although separated in various subgroups, these disciplines often created art together, combining and mixing art forms in their media. Organizi organizing cinematic and theoretical sh uh, theatrical shows, as well as reading and singing groups for proletarians to prepare and celebrate May Day. These cultural producers amplified the corporal and sensorial experience of participants. By affecting multiple senses, proletarian artists rendered expressive, formerly invisible, inaudible, and intangible realities to mark proletarian territories during May Day strikes and demonstrations. In this way, art was not so much representational as effective and sensational, and instead invoked a synthesized longing among proletarians worldwide for a different society. Moreover, proletarian artists strived to have proletarians actively engage in producing May Day art, transforming them into artists. This not only included the production of different art, but was also seen in the repurposing of everyday objects such as cloth or paper into flags, banners, badges, posters, or leaflets. 
In doing so, proletarian artists attempted, attempted to undo hierarchies in the production of art and equip proletarians with expressive strategies and territorial markers to bolster support for resistance available whenever and wherever. Crucial to the cultural production of Mayday was art the artistic and machinic syntheses of multiple spaces in Mayday celebrations in relation to the human perception of space and time. In other words, it is the mental exercise to synthesize singular spatial temporal events into coherent multiplicities. In the case of Mayday, these were, for example, the Haymarket riot in 1886, the first Mayday in Paris in 1890, a Mayday Tea Party in Tokyo in 1905 by Hei Minsha, and the first Mayday in the Soviet Union in 1918. These events created a coherent unity of heterogeneous elements that would become an annual proletarian festival celebrated worldwide. While celebrating May Day on the same day worldwide created a sense of simultaneity and unison among various proletarian milieus, it was art, technology, and machinery that helped interlock the spatial gaps between the direct experience of local events and events elsewhere. National festivals were informed by the linearity of capitalist clock time in a chronological sequence of past, present, and future. In contrast, May Day countered such understandings of space-time with a patchwork of disparate in events made possible by various technological innovations, such as montage. Proletarian movements created memories of proletarian struggles worldwide, where space-times are a contingent of overlapping of pasts, presents, and futures happening simultaneously. Instead of a chronological time alone, experiences exist as events, each of which produce a particular space-time. By synthesizing or ostracizing events, proletarian movements joined memories together into their own spatial temporal calendar. For example, in an article called May Day First Recalls April 12th, uh, Chen Tao wrote how May Day reminded the proletariat of all the suffering they have endured so far. This included April 12th incident, also known as the Second Shanghai Massacre, a purge by the Kuomintang on communists in 1927. Concretely then, the proletarian calendar in East Asia unfolded as a synthesis of events such as the May 1st, 1919 demonstrations in colonial Korea, March 15th, 1928, and 20, uh, April 16th, 29, which were the mass arrests of leftist activists in Japan, May 30th, 1925, the Shanghai massacre, the first one, and then June 17, 1895, the annexation of Taiwan, to just name a few. These were all events linked directly and indirectly to Japanese imperialism or imperialism at large. While these events could easily be exploited to essentialize ethno-nationalism, proletarian movements strive to commemorate these events as a shared proletarian calendar combined with annual, annual international days, like January 15, which was the 3L day, the Lenin, Luxembourg, and Liebknecht, March 8, International Women's Day, March 1st, International Workers' Day, and August 1st, the International Anti-War Day. In synthesizing proletarian memories and experiences worldwide, of which May Day was arguably the most compelling platform, proletarian movements count, coined a counter-memory, which challenged the homogenous and linear time of the ruling classes. Photography was one medium used to celebrate uh, media proletarian achievements and to inspire proletarians who did not participate to join the year after. Made possible by printing press, proletarian journals explored the possibilities of photomontage. Although the lack of technological resources among some proletarian cultural movements did not always allow complicated compositions on the same page or successive pages, editors tried to create visual narratives by placing pictures together. They did so to tell a story of one made a demonstration held at different locations or combine pictures of multiple made a processions, which created a sense of omnipresence and interconnections while downplaying distances between made events. In a spatial, uh, special made issue of Battle Flag, a Japanese proletarian journal, there was a made photo montage printed over uh, several pages immediately after the table of contents. The photographs shot at various May Day celebrations in Tokyo in 20, 1927 and 1929 are cut out of the frame and glued over each other, synthesizing disparate events. On the left, demonstrators liberated from the photographic frame march to the right on the page. The static transforms into movement. These, th this movement is further amplified by mixing several photographs and various perspectives. The moving demonstrators appear to march from afar, gradually increasing in size as they move towards the viewer. 
Eventually, they merge with another group of demonstrators on the right bottom while all heading towards the uh, gathering the left bottom at Shibuya Ura, Shiba Ura Park, uh, which is the location the Mayday procession commences. Then on the right, on the next page, Mayday celebrations in Tokyo are linked with the Mayday celebrations worldwide through montage. It is at the Tokyo demonstration. Demonstrators continue to march and merge with foreign comrades towards the Red Square in Moscow. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Japanese colonies where Mayday demonstrations were completely banned, editors had to find creative ways to show their readers Mayday celebrations within the rules of the cultural policy. In the left-leaning journal 3000 Lee, the editors combined photos of Mayday taken in Osaka together with photos from Children's Day in Kyongsong. The photo montage juxtaposes a Mayday celebration demonstration in Osaka, which included Korean female workers, with Children's Day in Kyongsong, celebrated on the first Sunday of May, close to May Day. Children's Day <clears throat> was also rebaptized in a proletarian festival, resembling May Day, where, quote, worker and farmer children uh, in Choson march in lines with red flags in their hands to intimidate the bourgeois children who normally act big, end quote. Like the photo montage in Battle Flag, it grouped photographs depicting spatially separated events in hopes of inventing a relationship between them, transcending geographical distances and national boundaries. Despite Mayday being prohibited in colonial Korea, editors managed to interconnect colonial spaces to the resistance of the world proletariat and bring distant proletarian milieus in a relational unity of shared goals th through photo montage. Photo montage allowed photographs with various perspectives to be detached and rearranged in order to bring heterogeneous milieus among the worldwide proletariat together in an assemblage. As a result, result, raw material from the living present in multiple space times is framed together and overlaps various past, presents, and futures to form a consolidated unity intended to show viewers how these events are related. While the photographs depicted depict the repetition of annual May Day celebrations, it is the in-between of overlapping photographs where a, a relationality between different singularities emerge. The marriage of photographs was an artistic forging of solidarity among proletarians who were spatially apart. These montage, montage techniques became crucial in various proletarian arts forms to render visible relations between disparate proletarian struggles worldwide. In addition to photographic montage, proletarian cultural workers experimented with new media such as film. Among the emerging proletarian film units in East Asia was ProKino, the Proletarian Filmmakers League. Founded in Tokyo in 1921, which commenced filming May Day demonstrations or other topics suitable for May Day screenings. Each year organized May Day film events to show their movies to proletarians and supporters across Japan. Prokino was among the first in East Asia to experiment with new styles and cameras during 1921 to 1934. One of its members, Sasa Genju, argued in his essay, Toy Weapon Camera, in favor of using the quote bourgeois toy, a 9.5 millimeter uh, pate baby, as a weapon of class struggle. The size and mobility of the pate baby allowed filmmakers such as Sasa to bring cameras into daily life, to film demonstrations from nearby and even in the midst of crowds. Film could transform, Sasa explains, quote, the un unorganized masses in conscious participants, end quote. Sasa was convinced that film, especially when taking, when taking using portable cameras, um, had the expressive power to consolidate fragments of daily life captured separately into a cohesive whole, not unlike montage photography. Sasa Genji shot one of the first amateur films of on May Day uh, 1927, initiating a reoccurring theme of proletarian film movements. Among the extant films of proletarian film in East Asia, there is only one incomplete uh, May Day silent movie titled 12th Annual Tokyo May Day. Different from studio movies, Pro Kino shot the movie outside, documenting May Day participants from their standing point at Shiba Uda Park and walking by a Showa road towards Ueno Park. This route passes the Imperial Palace in Hibiya where two days earlier the annual celebration of the emperor's birthday, so-called Tencho Setsu, had taken place. This highlighted the stark contrast between Tencho Setsu's right-wing nationalism and May Day's left internationalism. The montage of a celluloid was a way for proletarian filmmakers to train, aid, and augment the mental perception of synthesizing fragmented realities. 
Of specific note is how Prokino actively used filmic machinery to transform spectators' viewpoints, aiding the human eye with the camera eye. This is not unlike Walter Benjamin's sentiment as he wrote, quote, with film, a new realm of consciousness comes into being, end quote. Granted, the seven-minute Mayday movie itself is not spectacular for its montage as compared to other contemporary movies and proletarian movies as well. Instead, it serves to expand this discussion of synthesis as a method of forging relations of solidarity within the prol uh, proletarian cultural production of Mayday. And Pro Kino frequently showed these movies during proletarian film nights. These film screenings were rare events for proletarians to see themselves on the silver screen. By seeing themselves, Prokino detached the living present out of a particular space-time through the mechanical reproduction of film. Prokino's filmmakers then coupled the content of the film with the audience's own experiences, creating a link between a virtual and an actual. In doing so, filmmakers created a register of recognition and enumerated a singular experiences into a multiplicity of collective consciousness, resembling the secured nature of film montage. They rendered the chaos of the living present visible on the silver screen, and in the merging of heterogeneous components, created a unity of proletarians. Proletarian film directors tried to create st strategic images of political formation in order to trigger viewers' sensory motor system, hopefully linking these images to thought. And among Japanese uh, proletarian and bourgeois writers, China, and especially Shanghai, was a popular topic for their stories. While bourgeois writers were fascinated by Shanghai's cosmopolitanism and exhilarating nightlife, proletarian writers strive to write about the exploitation by imperialist and capitalist, both domestic and foreign. They also wrote about the revolutionary potential presented in the city and beyond. And immediately after the Manchurian incident in 1931, proletarian activists Hua Di and Ren Jun interviewed proletarian writers in Japan, Akita Uja Kubukawa Ineko, Fujireda Takeo, and also Muriyama Tomoyoshi, whose works were translated and read in China. By interviewing proletarian intellectuals and artists, Hua and Ren aimed to show that not all Japanese were the enemy and that many Japanese proletarian writers opposed the Japanese invasion in Manchuria. In the interview with Muriyama, Hua Di asked him why he wrote two works, Record of Gang Violence and Record of Victory, about China. Muriyama stressed the cross-spatial relations between proletarians beyond national borders. Moreover, he argued that certain subject matter of unique, unique events can be made visible with the help of art and be made legible through writing to distant audiences. This could bring disparate proletarian milieus together in a shared consciousness, not unlike the methods of montage and linkage discussed earlier. Muriyama's choice of writing a record of the Mayday victory in Shanghai functioned as a mnemonic device which increased common awareness and shared memories among East Asian proletarians. And then the story that I discuss at length in my manuscript, uh, Record of Victory, is divided among uh, three acts and seven scenes. And starting on April 19, 1930, the play Record of Victory tells the story of proletarian couple Hua, Huang Aliou and Zhang Guo Rei who live in the workers' district Zhabei, Shanghai. Aliou works as a train driver for the Shanghai Train Company and acts as the head of the Zhabei picket faction. And Zheng is a conductor for a bus, bus company and the captain of the new pay, Park Depot faction. The two are actively involved in organizing and preparing for May Day, communicating with leaders of various unions and labor sectors, as well as delegating tasks such as handing out flyers and informing proletarians about the upcoming strikes. Uh, and they also include uh, a lot of the or unorganized uh, workers. And so to trade, to create the alliances in the events of a uh, unity to be uh, celebrated and vi made visible during May Day strikes. And so the first half of the play covers the organization of May Day, while the second half deals with the execution of May Day strikes. Each scene of the play is set on a particular time before, during, or after May Day. Muriyama aimed to show a full account of all that is involved surrounding May Day, the preparation, the actual strike, and the afterlife of May Day. Ultimately, similar to artistic modes, methods of, of montage and linkage seen in May Day artifacts, Muriyama laid out a diagram of how to assemble distant struggles among proletarians into a shared agenda. This corresponds to the dispersed groups of demonstrators con consolidated under the banner of May Day. One of the in innovations Muriyama added to the record of victory stage 
was film footage projected as part of the stage, which supplemented the decor and the actors' performances. Although playwrights had used existing film footage in previous years, for record of victory, Muriyama made a special request to Prokino to produce new footage. Mixing new footage with the actual play, Muriyama aimed to produce what he called Renza, or linkage, in order to assemble dispersed events, which not unlike montage, strongly reflects the attempts of proletarian artists to practice techniques of synthesis. Besides film footage, Muriyama also asked the Proletarian Music Alliance, which had a substantial repertoire, uh, to sing Mayday songs live on stage, solving a problem in cinema at the moment, uh, at that time at least, which uh, lacked color and sound. Considering Mayday the ultimate subject matter on which to practice in synthesis, Muriyama emphasized the length of scenes in his discussion of record of victory first and foremost. He stated that the length of, of scenes in proletarian theater is significantly shorter than that in bourgeois theater due to the proletarian audiences having less time because of long working hours. This was of course contrasted with the bourgeoisie who have plenty of time to enjoy hours of theater according to Muriyama. He calculated that a play can be 200 pages long at most but was often shorter as proletarian theater shows usually uh, multiple plays and mobile theater shows were short in general. Between acts, the curtains were dropped and the stage was brightened in the theater to provide a break for the audience, whereas scenes required a theoretical, uh, theatrical blackout to change the stage. These breaks and changes operated as spatial temporal contractions and relaxants to ensure the relation between spectators and the performers. According to Muriyama, this was quite different from cinema, where one cuts made transitions between scenes unnecessary and camera angles can change perspective. This flexibility in cinema was opposed to the fixed distance in theater between spectators and the stage. If the playwright found it difficult to balance two scenes and failed to make the transition smoothly, spectators who have established an intimacy with a particular scene might lose attention and patience. In his methodology, Muriyama's emphasized that when a transition between scenes remains unclear, the relation among its components would cease, making it difficult for spectators to understand. It then follows that it was important that a playwright establish a relation between the allotting of scenes and the content of the play. In the case of Record of Victory, Muriyama did this by having all scenes take place in small rooms. He also created syntheses with the help of music, film, and decor between the characters on stage and in the imagined crowds outside during May Day celebrations. If the play failed to show the correlation between events played in successive scenes, then prior training of mental perception, which helped spectators synthesize distant space of struggles, would not succeed. Ultimately, from Muriyama and other play, uh, proletarian playwrights, proletarian theater took up different worlds where various elements coagulate dialectically into unity and decide their own future. In scene four, before the start of the third annual, uh, the third and final act, four intertitles are lowered onto the stage as a countdown towards May Day. The intertitles show dispersed strikes preceding May Day, which are happening at various moments in different locations across Shanghai. They seriously disrupt the chronological and metric time of continuously clicking factory clocks, forming a web of interconnected and expanding nodes, striking workers, sabotage the perpetuated commodity production. They replace the homogeneous and articulated time of capitalism with the spasmodic and absorbing time of a general strike. Building up the climax through successive intertitles, the stage descriptions tells the reader how a, quote, great number of people, including the audience, sing the Mayday songs in chorus from a pianissimo and gradually changing into fortissimo. Muriyama not only uses uh, the actors on stage, but also invites spectators to become active, active participants in and creators of expressive manners. Breaking the Brechtian fourth wall, the play blurs the borders between art and quotidian, quotidian life, and between author producer and audience consumer. In doing so, the play allows proletarians to experiment with methods designed to express proletarian milieus. Uh, markers of territory emerge and are needed to deterritorialize capitalist refrains, such as the working day. The day after May Day, Awu and Alio reflect on the grouping of proletarians. Acknowledging the international importance of Mayday for the worldwide proletariat, Awu reads a manifesto printed with drawings that was circulated in preparation for Mayday. The manifesto notes the relationship between the strikes of various proletarian groups in Shanghai and the unemployment struggles of proletarians elsewhere, such as in Germany and America. The interconnection between these proletarian milieus formed the assemblage of the world proletariat, 
that consolidates a decisive battle in the fight with imperial power east and west of China. In joining hands and unifying distant components, proletarians aim to liberate themselves from the iron shackles of imperial capitalism. The proletarians in record of victory are, aware, are well aware of their fragile center, linking their semi-stable milieus and thus warn their constituents to be vigilant against enemy threats which would undermine their victories. Proletarians gather at the courtyard of the Honey Textile Factory on May 7th to hold a disbandment ceremony. This, the disbandment demonstrates the proletarians' understanding of the need for flexibility as they respond adequately to changes in their environment. Alio throws hundreds of leaflets out of the window, which are received by a shouting crowd. The leaflet praises the heroic, heroic fights of proletarians of May Day, but also urges proletarian proletarians to prepare for their next campaign protesting war again on August 1st. Kuriyama's record of victory urges readers to understand how in preparing and celebrating May Day, the production of proletarian territories should never be finished nor final. They require vigilance and flexibility in order to make alloplastic changes and synthesis among different groups possible. Today, I tried to demonstrate that Mayday celebrations contributed to the consolidation of numerous proletarian milieus, both in East Asia and worldwide. Crucial was the development of expressive matters found particularly in art. This expressivity in arts was able to synthesize and unify heterogeneous components associated with the proletarian struggle and develop useful rituals for planned and spontaneous strikes other than Mayday. Proletarian artists utilized various techniques such as montage, linkage, and connecting the, to resist the homogenous space-time of the imperialist capitalist order. They insist that uh, they instead constructed multi-directional space-times of international proletarian solidarity. Through photography, film, theater, singing, and literature, proletarian in, uh, co cultural movements aim to reach an as wide as an audience as possible, taking into account various levels of literacy among proletarians. They organize cultural May Day events not only to inform proletarians of how to celebrate and strike on May Day, but also to redefine the entire producer-consumer relation of art. They did this by incorporating proletarians in the production of May Day art and artifacts. The commitment to proletarian solidarity was not merely then an enterprise orchestrated by proletarian vanguards and intellectuals, but more importantly, what was forced with proletarians in the practice, experience and memory of May Day. Muriyama affirms this practice in record of victory that display the emergence of proletarian solidarity in direct action and cooperation at the grassroots level. Altogether, the May Day Festival and its cultural production strive for unity among proletarians in East Asia in order to overcome divisive identifications of the capitalist imperialist world order. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, well, thank you very much for, um, for this uh, very interesting talk. One of the things that's special about uh, capitalism, or at least the socialist critique of capitalism, is impersonal domination, that it's the abstractions of commodity fetishism and whatnot that, that uh, in some sense, are the enemy. Yeah, it's, not, it's not going to do the job just to get rid of uh, one or two capitalists. Um, so actually, uh, you know, a strange, I feel uncomfortable sort of referring to him in a, in a way, but Zizek uh, pointed out that uh, that for art, this poses a bit of a problem because if you want to sort of portray the enemy, you know, in, in, in his words, then suddenly you become an anti-Semite, yeah, because um, you, you have the capitalist, yeah, who's the enemy, yeah. So I, I'm just sort of curious uh, if you can talk about the portrayal of uh, the enemy of the bourgeoisie of, of capitalists in the art you've been looking at and, and how people struggled with this question of of, of you know, portraying an abstraction. Right. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. That's indeed an, an important and, and complicated question in the sense that also indeed proletarian writers struggled very much um, with some kind of sometimes creating too much of stereotypes of the bourgeois and capitalist figures. So in Record of Victory, the interesting thing is that actually when this May Day starts, they switch the perspective and they discuss May Day unfolding from the, the capitalist perspective and very much show how the capitalists are worried that that such that Shanghai is being taken over from all, all, all sides. Um, well, the typical representation is, of course, the bit kind of uh, overfed uh, male kind of uh, factory uh, owner with a cigar. And so um, 
that's the typical representation, but the proletarian writers, of course, had to somewhat accommodate that they themselves are come sometimes from petite bourgeois or bourgeois, bourgeois backgrounds. And they uh, had very much the question, can we represent the proletariat as ourselves? And so th that's where you see the investment to try to uh, invite proletarians to also uh, be part of the production pro process of arts. But obviously, there was a lot of accusation back and forth that, well, uh, you yourself are from the bourgeois background, or you yourself, your parents have way too much money. So what do you know? And it, even to an extent that read a writer like um, Hayashi Fusao, he liked dancing or somehow, and then they would say, that's way too bourgeois, that type of dancing. And so in the private accounts, you get very much nitty gritty of how they accuse one another of all kinds of things. And so um, that's that's one thing that, that becomes an endless problem, right? I think Marston Anderson in his Limits of Realism for the Chinese Literature also showed very much um, the, sometimes the debates, the, the, the limits of to what extent they, uh, they could really identify with proletarian uh, figures. But I think another important point to put out is the very production process of, of art, that indeed their journals were also linked to publishers. And in the, in the Japanese case, for example, uh, major publisher houses like Kaizo and Chuo Koron were very much invested in the 1920s to publish proletarian literature because it was somehow a trend among students, right? They called it the Marxist boy and the Engels girl. And so um, a, a journal like uh, Battle Flag also praised itself. Oh, we have 5,000 journals sold or we have 10,000 journals sold. They had uh, advertisements in their journals too, right? And so um, uh, to maybe echo Zizek then somehow to kind of try to critique your object. Sometimes you are slipped into your object of critique, right? You become sometimes your own object of critique. And so I think that is the difficult tension. How do we disconnect um, our modes of production? I think that somehow is analogous to maybe YouTube, Facebook, and those kind of platforms that are being used for, uh, for socialist activism or other forms of political activism. We still need to use the circuits of uh, capitalist kind of conglomerates, right? And so that's uh, def definitely a challenge, yes. Yeah, thank you so much. I think some the, the, the two points that you raised somewhat are in interconnected, right? The class relation or the class struggle that needs to be worked through and then another border, which is indeed a very important border, the urban farmer. And, there's still many more borders that we can think of too. Uh, I take also try to take up the question of indigeneity, for example, as another question. Um, but to stick to the urban farming. So yeah, in the historical debates, we see, of course, an endless kind of uh, defining and redefining of who actually constitutes the proletariat, right? And so we have a kind of a narrow vision that it needs to be the, the industrial worker from the factory, right? Um, but in the case of East Asia, as, as you also know, a lot of uh, the, the majority of East Asia was maybe for very much in the rural, right? Where the industrialization had not uh, taken place yet or uh, was just centered and, and centralized in, in the uh, metropoles. And so I, as I'm invested to create kind of these larger kind of uh, constructs of what the proletariat can, could have been, um, I keep the relationship somewhat open. So I take the idea of a, maybe a proletarian unnameable. And so that um, to see class, not so much as an identity as maybe some studies do, but to see class as a relationship. And so therefore that relationship uh, keeps shifting and being redefined. And so, but that allows me to have a certain open uh, avenue for who the proletariat uh, could, could have been. And I think that somewhat rhymes also historically with some a lot of the works that try to uh, keep introducing new figures that somehow they see also as part of the proletarian struggle. Um, that openness allowed for indeed, whether it were sex workers, uh, farmers, indigenous struggles, that all could somewhat be uh, connected through the proletariat. And I thought this was very much the strength of what the proletariat could have been, that it is this open um, system to interconnect struggles, I think that somehow maybe in our current moment, we sometimes miss by uh, too much of a great invest, uh, investment in identities. And I think the proletariat by resisting a certain identity, rather maybe a non-identitarian politics or a multiplicity of identities. But the urban farmer then, um, so yeah, indeed, um, I think a lot of the works that I also discussed take place in, in rural areas. 
the Manchurian, of course, is a particular one because that's where a lot of East Asians are brought together in interesting relationships. And so there is this uh, maybe tension where I, at the one moment, look more at the transregional uh, expressions of solidarity, more a form of East Asian solidarity. But that uh, immediately, often the writer or some other figures, maybe sometimes a little forced because they sometimes put some kind of the ideas or a certain form of literacy onto their figures that you would say, well, I'm not sure if someone in a Manchurian village was very much invested in certain kind of global struggles. So the writer sometimes intervenes there, but you definitely see. So I, for example, I have a couple of works that talk about the Wan Baoshan incident that are taken up by Chinese and Japanese writers then that brings together a lot of East Asians in struggles. They rewrite some of the historical outcome of the Wan Baoshan incident, which was an incident where a struggle between Koreans uh, creating the irrigation canal and the Chinese farmers getting upset. The Japanese military comes in to try to settle and they protect their Koreans as imperial subjects. Suddenly they, they, they do. Uh, and so this maybe has a kind of an eerie resonation with our current uh, moment. But um, what J Chinese and Japanese writers try to redo in the historical outcome is to show how these East Asians come together actually in solidarity and see the mutual kind of exploitation and how they're being used by capitalist imperial order. Obviously, then the characters somehow express that this is that what they do should also be uh, done at the greater international level, right? And maybe that's where you feel that the authors come in a bit too much. But I look at Esperanto, for example, the international uh, uh, auxiliary language, and then I look at also people in 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 rural areas who are able to write letters to uh, to fellow proletarian Esperantists in Germany, in Russia. Uh, elsewhere in the world. And that's a form of still, I think, international uh, connectivity where they can somewhat uh, express the local uh, connected through the global. And so that's where you definitely, I think, see somewhat um, uh, interconnections between these. But the urban form, farm was definitely a challenge, especially as most of the uh, proletarian writers were all kind of cozy in their proletarian, uh, in their urban uh, settlements, right? So it's definitely a uh, an important border to address for sure, yes. Not a direct name comes to mind right now, but I've seen multiple times, of course, the, the discussions in Japan, uh, the Marxist debates in the 1920s reflecting on the Meiji restoration of was it a, a pure bourgeois revolution or not, very much thought through the questions like, well, but we still have so much agrarian labor that continues as if nothing has changed. So. Do we have remnants of feudalism, et cetera, et cetera? Um, Taiwan, who might have been uh, mostly uh, used for sugar industrialization, but also remained very much so. The few proletarian writers we know from Taiwan are also mostly writing about the countryside. Uh, and so, and in Korea, the same thing. So I definitely think that many thought through that. And that's why I take the proletariat also as a broader term, because I not necessarily follow the line of that they need to be industrial uh, factory workers. I like to keep it open because then indeed you can include so much many more stories. And these stories often discuss just the quotidian uh, challenges of uh, the Japanese police officers in their village. Um, other those kind of tiny instances of, of the larger structures of imperialism, if you will, but also kind of, as I just said, with the Wan Baoshan incident, these kind of small places were sometimes then also in, uh, integrated uh, by uh, imperialist structures at large. And I definitely think that many thought through, uh, and many writers themselves came maybe also from rural uh, backgrounds, but definitely there was a, a, a kind of a broad consensus, I would say, that uh, they cannot ignore the agrarian because they would lo lose out way too much uh, the Russian Revolution was somewhat, of course, uh, also maybe a peasant uprising. So they were very much supported by that, uh, by that kind of thing. So many stories, yeah, uh, try to depict how farmers, peasants, smaller rural communities are very much invested in proletarian struggles, if you will, yeah. In Rebecca Carl's uh, book, I think the economist she was looking at is named uh, Wang Yanan. I, I think that yeah. was his name. That um, that in the actual sort of economics literature, there was a lot of consideration of, uh, you know, how do we understand like China's mode of production and its place in, 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 in you know, feudalism versus, uh, 
global capitalism. And, and, and so that would be, I mean, I, I don't remember the, the details of what Wang Yanan's uh, particular perspective was, but um, that, that would be a place I would look for thinkers who were dealing yeah. with that as well. The strength of Call and also Heritunian's arguments is very much to show how kind of the late development of capitalism in Japan and East Asia was very much capable of integrating the agrarian uh, economy without changing too much so that the lines of distribution and the food production could somewhat remain, even the spinning of wool somewhat could still all stay, but was already somewhat uh, connected still to the capitalist chains of production, yes. Just the f formal subsumption, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Last week, uh, Viren Murti was talking about, uh, this isn't maybe a fair characterization of what he was talking about, but it's a good way of introducing my question. Um, kind of how at the moment we're, I don't know who I mean by that, but we're having the problem that um, this notion of international solidarity can itself have a really kind of cosmopolitan, urban, you know, um, deracinated kind of sense where the whole point is to overcome the, the alienation of capitalism and yet somehow culturally it feels like uh, this you know in internationalism is kind of uh, in cahoots with alienation yeah right. and that and that the right is much better at saying uh, you know here's how not to be alienated feel yeah. french yeah, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about appeals to overcoming alienation and a sort of sense of uh, rootedness belonging maybe reappropriations of 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 elements of traditional um, society along the lines of, uh, you know, letter to Vera Zasulich and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I think this photo that I ended with in my presentation is somewhat interesting because it's a, it's a mayday in a rural area of Kanazawa, but on the outskirts of Kanazawa, and you see on the, down below the people still working, work, uh, wearing their hapi, the kind of local clothes. And it's very much seems like if you wouldn't know it's a May Day, it might just be a, a random uh, local festival. But um, yeah, there, the question of, uh, I think interesting is that, for example, figures like uh, Gramsci critique that uh, cosmopolitanism is a bourgeois kind of thing, denying the fact that proletarians can also live a somewhat cosmopolitan life by uh, forced migration or voluntarian migration and working in the, in the metropoles and being exposed to all kinds of things. But I think the way how to maybe just stick to the case of Mayday, but we can also think of Esperanto, but I think how they produced a form of belonging and rootedness was to integrate them in the processes again, so that the fact that they could produce them, their, their art, uh, that somewhat allowed uh, the, the sense of agency to get back the agency that they would somehow have lost with the, the displacement of, of, of their communities and also being dragged into these larger constructs of, of the nation states. And so uh, you can imagine a small community in Tohoku, the north of Japan, writing an Esperanto letter together to a, a community in the Soviet Union created a, a new sense of belonging. But there was, of course, a imperialism itself produced the, 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 the necessity of internationalism among the proletarians too, right? But by the, this the displacement and, and, and uh, the, 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 the destruction of roots. So a returning back was not maybe always possible, um, right? So the question maybe that Marx raised is how can we uh, reconnect the question of, 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 of our means of production with the lands? And I think as Marx warns us, there's, we cannot go back to a romantic kind of uh, appeal of, of, of the feudalism. And so the investment was very much how can we create new worker communities, right? And so that's where the, the, the class relationship created a new relation of, of, of belonging. In practice, of course, we have to admit that if Korean day laborers uh, would hit the work site with Japanese workers, that that was not then a very, always a peaceful and harmonious uh, kind of get together. But it was often also, for example, created by different wages, right? That the day labor in Korea would get paid less and various uh, uh, restrictions through the, the production of a Korean identity on behalf. And that's the tension that they had to deal with, right? And so we have to admit maybe that that didn't work out as much, but I think the, the, the appeal that the proletarian kind of has had as an international community 
uh, can still be of importance maybe for today of how we can interconnect struggles. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, thank you so much for um, this. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for this uh, talk. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for waking up so early. Yeah. No, thank you so much for yeah. showing up. And thank you for having me. It was great to see everyone. And hopefully, we have another chance to meet somewhere.